too, Abe. Well, judging by the latest profit results, a decade of deregulation has been good news for our major banks. Little wonder then that they and other financial players want even less control on the way they do business. Will the government listen? Well, today, Stan Wallace, the man charged with advising the government on the future of the financial sector, gave some clues to his thinking on these issues. First up, he made it clear that change cannot be ignored, making the point that he wants to see more competition. At the same time, he revealed that his committee isn't wedded to the current policy that protects our six major financial institutions from takeovers. Of course, the release of today's discussion paper isn't the last word. Next month, the inquiry will hold public hearings, and that's when the committee is likely to get a rather different point of view. Already, some have warned that greater deregulation could result in a takeover tornado, leading inevitably to less competition. Bank unions, too, will point out that new technology coupled with takeovers will mean up to 20,000 redundancies. Well, after listening to both sides, the inquiry's chairman, Stan Wallace, will determine his final recommendations and present them to Treasurer Peter Costello next March. In just a few minutes, we'll talk with Stan Wallace, with a top banker and a life insurance boss, along with a consumer advocate. But first, this background report from Greg Wildsmith. We're in the money. We're in the money. We've got a lot of what it takes to get along. For those who believe that banks are rapacious, uncaring of their customers, captive to the markets, the bank profit reporting season has been instructive. The National, $2.1 billion, the first Australian public company to break the $2 billion barrier. I think it's a very workmanlike performance in, in a tough environment. The ANZ, $1.1 billion. We think um, it's a good, solid, respectable number. Westpac, $1.1 billion. Over $120 billion bank, so profits on that $120 billion are still less than one cent on the dollar. The Commonwealth, $1.1 billion. In total, the four big banks have piled up more than $5.5 billion profit, but they want more. Australia's most powerful banker, Don Argus, says long-imposed government restrictions on competition should be abolished. What we're saying is let's, let's open it up. Uh, let's, let's have good open competition, have the, have the barriers to entry lowered, but also have the barriers to exit lowered so that if you're inefficient, then you, you disappear off the scene. The National Bank has lobbied hard for radical change. Before the election, it extended the Liberals' overdraft and donated $130,000 to campaign funds. The National wanted a sweeping inquiry into the financial system. So did the government. And it's being run by Stan Wallace, the president of the Business Council. Yeah, for me, it's been a very uh, illuminating experience. Uh, it's been a long time since I've been close to the workings of the financial system and uh, I've learned a lot about, you know, about the whole process. Wallace, as a former chief executive of Amcor, the paper company, must marvel at the 17 and 18 percent return on equity reported by some of the banks. His investigations, the biggest review in 15 years, has been swamped with advice from every sector of the financial industry and from the bureaucrats who regulate it. Today, the committee, dominated by determined deregulators, handed down a hefty paper discussing options for reform. Wallace and his colleagues say the keys to a more efficient financial system are to increase investment returns, in other words, bigger profits, and the need for Australian companies to be able to compete globally. The four big banks, the National, the Commonwealth, the ANZ and Westpac, along with the two biggest insurance and superannuation companies, the AMP Society and National Mutual, make up the so-called six pillars of the Australian financial system. The big six have effectively been a protected species in the financial jungle. No takeovers allowed or even friendly mergers. And the Competition and Consumer Commission has been very keen that there be no further concentration of power at the big end of town. But all of that could change if the financial inquiry decides that there should be a much less regulated market. The six pillars is about whether the four banks and the two major life companies uh, can get together and we will be looking for the, you know, the, the rationale uh, one way or another. Clearly, I think the weight of submissions would say it's, it's hard to find justification for that. Banking analysts like Gordon Fell assert unequivocally that bank rationalisation would be good for Australia. Well, you'd have a situation all of a sudden where you had, rather than th four major banks, you have three major banks. We estimate the savings to be something like 
a third of the operating expenses on a pre-tax basis. I beg your pardon? We're not for sale, actually. We're priceless. <laughs> The ANZ's chief executive, Don Mercer, laughs off takeover speculation. But his counterpart at the National, Don Argus, is blunt. No, and, and, and you know, everyone's for sale. It's, uh, you know, the, 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 price of, the price of survival is performance. Your, share, your shareholders normally dictate whether you're for sale or not. The National is cashed up and ready to buy. Clearly the National is, a, is an advocate of rationalisation. Clearly banks like Westpac uh, have made it clear that they will participate uh, if appropriate. It would allow further concentration in the market, which we believe would be anti-competitive. And for consumers, uh, we believe the question of choice, particularly if you're in regional Australia or rural Australia, there would be a massive closure of bank branches. Right, OK, on the 27th of November, came through for $543.20. Customers are adapting by increasingly turning to phone banking and electronic banking, and this trend poses great challenges for the regulators. Home computer banking, the development of stored value cards, telemachines and the prospect of home ATMs makes it hard enough to track the money flow. But internet banking, still in its infancy, puts an end to the concept of a paper trail. Protecting consumers in an era of digital cash requires a much more flexible system of government supervision. There's enough factual evidence around to suggest that some of the regulators in fact haven't kept up with some of the changes in the financial services industry. These days, Australians are thinking hard about the future and the choices they have. Increasingly, there's significant overlap in the financial products market. Insurance companies are invading the home mortgage sector Banks are promoting insurance products, and every company wants a slice of the superannuation bonanza. But should there be a super regulator encompassing the Reserve Bank, the Insurance and Superannuation Commission, the Securities Commission, and even the Competition and Consumer Commission? The Reserve Bank opposes the notion of a super regulator and argues for the status quo. For its part, the Competition Commission is fighting on two fronts defending its role on consumer protection and stressing the need to enforce competition policy. On that, the regional banks are strongly supportive. We think that the Australian Competition and Consumer Commission is the right way to manage uh, mergers and acquisitions moving forward and that uh, the ACCC should not be interfered with overall. Yet the most influential view to the Wallace inquiry may be from the Treasury. It urges extraordinary change. Banks should no longer have a special status. Foreign bank takeovers of major Australian banks ought not be blocked without very good cause. And the Reserve Bank could be stripped of its implicit duty to protect bank depositors. All this in the name of competition and efficiency. Mr Wallace and his committee will have to evaluate where the public interest lies. That report from Greg Wildsmith. And now to our guests. Stan Wallace is the chairman of the Financial System Inquiry. From 1977 until July this year, he was managing director of AMCOR. He sits on a number of boards, including Coles Meyer, and has stepped aside from his position on the AMP board for the duration of the inquiry. And he joins us tonight from Melbourne. Louise Sylvan is chief executive officer of the Australian Consumers Association, the publisher of Choice magazine. She was recently appointed by the federal government to the newly created National Advisory Council on Consumer Affairs and she joins us tonight from Sydney. Jeff Tomlinson is Group Managing Director of National Mutual, a leading provider of insurance, superannuation and savings products. Last year he guided National Mutual through a $1 billion merger with the French insurance group AXA and he joins us tonight from Melbourne. And finally, Greg Moynihan is the Acting Chief Executive Officer of the Bank Assurance Group, Suncorp Metway QIDC, created recently by the Queensland Government. And he joins us tonight from Brisbane. So welcome to, your, to all of you. Thank you very much for joining us for this discussion. Now tell me, Stan Wallace, I know you said today at uh, your press conference that you received something like 268 submissions. Of those submissions from the financial institutions, did the bulk of them, did you decide in the end, really reflect self-interest rather than a broader national interest? There was certainly a propensity in those submissions amongst certain groups to, to look at the issues within their own particular box, but there are also major organisations who, who stepped outside the box. 
Uh, we're very satisfied with the quality of the submissions. The, the committee has a lot of valuable material on which to proceed at this point, Maxine. You said today also that uh, basically the, the Australian financial system is pretty sound and it has become more competitive. Is there then a demonstrated need, do you think, for dramatic change or is it simply a matter of, of more fine-tuning? Mm, well, you can, you can take a, a viewer across the spectrum. There are those that would argue that, that uh, the systems work well, it's not broke. Uh, fine-tuning is what's required. On the other hand, if you look at the propensity for change in this industry over a period of five and ten years, uh, the existing regulatory structure may become quickly outmoded. And what this committee has to do is really to assess some of those visions and alternative scenarios and decide where we're prepared to pitch the regulatory structure, but at the same time keeping the system safe. And the weight of submissions again veered towards the, I suppose, the more extreme end of change? No, I'd say the submissions uh, did not articulate a particularly radical global view because most people did look at it from their own perspectives and we've now traversed the world and the marketplace and I think the committee itself is developing quite a view of the future which is the basis on which we will proceed to, to formalise our recommendations. All right. One area, of course, uh, the, the headline issue, I, I imagine, for uh, uh, tomorrow's newspapers, almost unanimous support, as you said uh, in your discussion paper, for the abolition of the six pillars policy. Now, does that point to an inescapable conclusion for your final report? Now, I made it clear, Maxine, we're not about uh, working on the, the majority vote. This, this committee is dedicated to getting the right answers for Australia and you couldn't necessarily conclude because of the weight of submissions have gone in a particular direction on a particular issue that that's the way we will go. But this discussion paper is not an interim report. It's not attempting to predict outcomes. It's simply saying here are all the issues that have come to us and uh, that's, it's, it's there to stimulate discussion and responses and we would hope the next round of submissions will be much more focused on the issues both you know, for and against. Does the, uh, to what extent though does the committee now have to concern itself say with the outcome of any possible relaxation of this policy? I mean as the Reserve pointed out and you, you had this in your report, the Reserve pointed out we could end up if this policy were to change with one of the most concentrated banking sectors in the industrialised world. Will the committee consider those sorts of ramifications? Absolutely, but we will not be considering the specifics of any particular merger. We've made that clear. We will look at the framework for the assessment of mergers in a competitive sense, who should do the regulating. We should look at, we should look at the prudential issues associated with mergers. We should look at foreign ownership. We should look at six pillars and other, other restrictions. And will you in fact make a definite recommendation one way or the other? You won't end up with a, a neutral position? Uh, I've, we have signalled clearly that the six pillars will receive a, uh, a, clear, a clear view from this committee. The other important aspect that we will pursue is, is the changing nature of this market, the, the forces which will cause redef may cause redefinitions of this market and they will be, I believe, relevant uh, findings for whoever is the competition regulator. All right. Jeff Tomlinson, just on this point about the six mergers policy, how have you interpreted what you've heard today? I mean, are you holding the champagne and not quite anticipating 1997 to be the year of mergers, or how are you feeling about it? No, I don't see it that way, Maxine. Um, uh, I think that uh, we've got to look at the major factors which are impacting on our industry, and I see them as being three. Firstly, this industry is a global business these days, and globalisation is upon us and will continue second one is convergence and I think in a couple of years time we won't be talking about banks and insurance companies we'll be talking about financial institutions rather than those generic names and the other third thing which is impacting on us all is of course technology and I think when you look at the impact of those three factors over a period of time I think you do quickly come to the conclusion there will be the abolition of the six pillars if this industry is to survive and prosper in this global world. On the other hand, uh, this will be a political decision at the end of the day and a government, uh, this government, may very well take the view, despite what sort of the signals the Treasurer is sending at the moment, that this could be bad politics. They may say questionable benefits, and as we heard, submissions to the report have, have made this point, that arguably a lot of efficiencies don't necessarily come from mergers. Well, I think that's arguable, but I suppose as a person in commerce rather than politics, I will push the what I call a commercial point of view, and obviously I'll leave it to the politicians to decide whether they can live with the commercial um, advocacy. All right. Uh, Louise Sylvan, uh, why does the Consumers Association not feel that uh, big is necessarily beautiful? 
Uh, well, it's not the case that it's uh, necessarily true that uh, uh, bigger banks offer consumers better services or, in fact, that that offers you more competition. There's no evidence that uh, consumers derive significant benefits from uh, bank mergers or even bank mergers with insurance uh, companies. Uh, so I think we'd want to, uh, rather than see more concentration uh, in the Australian market, if those banks uh, want to merge with something and get bigger and compete globally and internationally, then rather than let them get more dollars, uh, in the Australian scene, uh, let them buy an international bank and compete better internationally. What about though, the, the critical mass argument uh, that uh, bank mergers are needed to create the sort of entity that can compete? I don't think that that argument has much credibility anymore. Uh, we have examples, for example, like the uh, ANZ, which is a, a relatively small bank uh, in the global marketplace, uh, but in fact it wa has one of the best international networks. I think much more depends on how uh, effectively competitive these banks are than in fact their size. But one would have to say the, the weight of the industry submissions is definitely against you. Uh, well, that's absolutely true, but uh, the weight of the industry submissions uh, uh, to the Wallace Inquiry is is uh, essentially a weight of major industry opinion. That is, in fact, one of the problems, I think, uh, at the moment. The vast majority uh, of the submissions that have been made to the Wallace Inquiry have come from industry numbers and industry positions, and that's something that I think the committee is going to have to work very hard at, is actually balancing uh, that substantial uh, set of industry submissions with what they haven't heard, particularly, which is uh, the average consumer view of these issues. Now, Stan Wallace, this is the period you're coming into now, isn't it? You must be expecting to hear much more of uh, an alternate view. Well, that's why we put this paper up, Maxine, so that uh, interested parties can give us a very clear response. Can I just make the point about six pillars? I mean, it is a particular restriction which says the two insurance companies can't get together with the four banks. It doesn't necessarily prejudge the outcome about mergers between, between big banks or, in fact, uh, insurance companies. I mean, that will clearly be an issue decided by the competition regulator and what other, what other bodies are involved. And it will only occur, I'd suggest, if there's a far more competitive market looming with a lot of benefits for consumers. Greg Moynihan, in, in Queensland, how, how do you see this issue? I mean, you represent almost, I suppose, a mega bank in Queensland. How do you feel about potentially uh, national mega banks or mega institutions? Well, I think uh, our position is that uh, size isn't necessarily the critical issue here. Mergers can be good for a number of reasons. In our case, we believe we've put together an organisation which has some critical mass, but more importantly, it's able to put together a, a range of different products and services to customers. From day one, we start with uh, around about 50% of our revenues coming from insurances, which is a fairly unique position, certainly in Australia and almost in the world. But uh, how would you feel uh, if, with any change of policy, uh, one, of the, one of the big institutions were to move on your group in Queensland? I mean, we saw what happened when St George tried to move into Queensland. Well, I think, uh, you know, obviously, the uh, Wallace Inquiry will look very carefully at what are the barriers to uh, larger institutions uh, moving on smaller institutions. Our view is that, uh, generally, those restrictions or barriers that are there should be relaxed. However, I'd temper that or, or put a, a word of caution in that if they are going to be relaxed, it has to happen hand in hand with uh, relaxations on general barriers to entry and relaxations on uh, uh, the, I suppose, uh, competitiveness uh, or the lack of the level, level playing field that we have. Uh, certainly, if our major institutions are to uh, acquire other major institutions or smaller institutions, you need to make sure that the competitive climate is maintained by removing those barriers to entry. So in our situation in Queensland, we're, we're quite happy to uh, compete with the major institution, providing it is a level playing field. All right. What, what if the question of who determines the question of mergers? I mean, should this stay with the, the ACCC? Greg Moynihan first. Uh, I think in the case of determining uh, competitiveness, it should stay with the ACCC. However, I think there are circumstances where a treasurer or another body may need to uh, look at whether a merger may threaten the overall stability of the financial system, and therefore I think there needs to be a, a check or a balance in purely for those prudential reasons, not for competitiveness reasons. Right. Uh, now, Jeff Tomlinson, a certain uh, famous former treasurer, uh, stepped in at a critical point and prevented uh, your organisation getting together with the ANZ. Uh, so what's your view on the Treasurer's veto, those powers? I, I basically agree, agree with Greg. I think the ACCC has the prime role, but because of the size of the institutions we're talking about, they're large in Australian context, 
I think it would be appropriate for the Treasurer to have the final say. So I'm still in favour of the basic system as it applies today. Right. Now, Stan Wallace, what, what options did you set out on, on this point? Well, we have the complete, uh, you know, gambit of options, Maxine, uh, you know, that have been put to us. But the weight of submissions, again, says that the, this industry, the financial sector, should not be regulated in competition terms any differently in terms of mergers to the rest of industry. The issue is whether the overlays, for prudential reasons, the discretions that the Treasurer have, has, should, should in some way be changed. And we, we have the complete uh, range, range of options before us, and we will, have to, we will be addressing those. All right. If I could move now to the area of, uh, of uh, prudential supervision, because I think there is less consensus on this key area, isn't there? Stan Wallace, what arguments did you hear in favour of actually changing the status quo, and that is for uh, prudential regulation to move outside of the central bank? Well, I mean, prudential regulation does, in fact, take place outside outside the uh, central bank. The central bank at the moment regulates the banks, mm -hmm. and there are other prudential regulators in different formats for other non-bank financial institutions and and uh, insurance companies and and so on. Uh, ag again, it's a, it's a very complex issue. This and the the nature of prudential regulation is is based historically in terms of the banks on that the the deposit type product where there has to be a, an intense regulation of an intense promise but the world is changing in terms of who, who are providing those products the way the, the the weight of funds are moving beyond the, beyond the banking sector and we have some very complex issues to deal with in in, in this whole area well in fact what happens to the to the implied guarantee on depositors' funds? I mean, do, do you well, extend again, we, it or we, abolish it? We, uh, we had this very clear view put to us by the Treasury and by one or two other participants that there is a need to clarify this basis of, of, of implied guarantee to, uh, to people uh, who put their money into banks. And we have simply signalled that this is an issue that uh, the committee will address. It may well be over, over the coming years that uh, the whole nature of prudential regulation will change. Technology is having big impacts and there may, it may in the end be better ways of doing it. There may be other ways of making sure that certainly the interests of the small deposit are better protected than under, under the present system and we're prepared to look at those options. Yes, but it'd be a brave government, wouldn't it, that might consider abolishing you, Well, I made it clear that, mm. that this committee is concerned with maintaining those levels of protection and there may well be alternative and better ways down the track to do it. But that's that's only one, one of the possibilities that mm. we're addressing. Uh, Louise Sylvan, do you think there might be better ways of looking at this? Oh, I think there could be uh, better ways of actually protecting uh, the consumers, but certainly I think it would be completely unacceptable uh, to most people to think that they could come along and put their money uh, in a bank institution, for example, and uh, uh, be told that in fact that money could disappear tomorrow. I think uh, people remember uh, all too painfully uh, what happened with Pyramid and I don't think there are too many consumers that want to be put at that sort of risk again. Yes, yeah, Dan Wallace? Well, the fact is that there is no specific guarantee mm -hmm. for people who put money in banks. It's tied up with the Banking Act, the obligations of the Reserve Bank, particularly to deal with the issue if banks fall into difficulty and there may well be as I say, better ways to do this, which the committee committee is looking at. Mm. But, we're but, not dealing yeah, with a yeah. static situation at all. No, but I mean, at some stage throughout the 90s, we may be looking at the collapse of a national institution in the way that we saw the collapse of state institutions in the 80s. And it, it, it's almost inconceivable, I would suggest to you, for, for most Australian depositors to think that the government would not step in. They, but, they, but, people but, do assume but that, this, this obligation, don't they? Sure, but it doesn't necessarily happen that way around the world in other, other, other systems. And uh, we, are, we are going to look at those alternatives as they have been put before us. Now, Jeff Tomlinson, uh, from the point of your, pro point of view of your products, do you want any extension of a guarantee?